But this is a critical issue in macroeconomics, isn't it? That the origins of this money uh, determines... It, it's a question of causation, that the taxation, therefore, is not producing the money, it's not creating the money. So, but the, the taxation, by your explanation, creates the demand for the money in the broader economy. Yeah, yeah but see, this always has to be true, even if we go back to the banks. And I said that the reason you'll accept the bank liability is because you have a liability to the bank. Okay. From inception, we would not have accepted those bank liabilities unless we already had a liability to the bank. So it's that liability to the bank that drives your acceptance of it. Um, we have to have the taxes first before people will accept what they can use to pay the taxes with. So what government currency really is, is something that can be used to pay taxes. We have to have the tax first. So there's no way that you can pay the tax until the government has provided what it accepts in tax payment. Since currency comes from the government, it has to be spent first before we can pay taxes. Now, it doesn't complicate anything at all if we move from a system where the government spending really is in the form of coins and notes, and the tax payment really is in the form of coins and notes, to a system in which <coughs> it all occurs on the balance sheets of the banks. That doesn't complicate anything. So these, rather than taking the physical uh, uh, form of a piece of paper or a piece of um, worthless metal, um, just takes the form of electronic charges on computer tapes, doesn't change anything at all. The spending that is crediting the bank account has to come first before the tax payment that is debit of the account occurs. So it's still the, the logic the spending comes first, then the tax payment. That has to hold. Yeah, I think that, you know people try to stylize these very difficult ideas into things that they can understand in their everyday life. And you know, I've had conversations with people who genuinely believe that there are vehicles driving around with tax re tax revenue in them taking them to some place they don't know, where government agents sift through these tax receipts and prepare them to be spent. And, uh, and that's, that's sort of intuitive, that because we, we're told continually by mainstream economics and commentators, our politicians, the media, that that, that that's the way it is, that the government is like a household, relating it back to our intuitive experience as a household, that everything we do we, in terms of spending has to be first of all conditioned by the question of where we're going to get the money from. And so we work out ways in which we get the money and we go to the bank to get the money or you know, we watch our credit card and we know that in the back of our minds we've got the money to pay that off in the month. Or we go to the bank to borrow to get the money. Uh, or we might go on eBay and sell something to get some money. And that's all conditioning the fact that we are financially constrained as households. Because we use the currency. Whereas the national government or the sovereign government, the issuer of the currency, is not financially constrained at all. How can you say that the, the issuer of its own currency is, is, has some constraint on it that's financial? And so once you understand that there is no analogy between the household and the sovereign national government, and that, that analogy is uh, peddled in the textbooks, the intermediate macro textbooks, by famous writers. Once you understand that there is no analogy, then you really are on the road to understanding where the causality lies. That you can't pay your taxes until a government spent. You can't buy a government bond until the government spent the funds. It's uh, not possible in an accounting sense. Uh, yeah, carrying on with the analogies, we often talk about government 
revenue and government income. And we, uh, the, the terminology is really unfortunate. Taxes, we call that government income, but really it's not an income in the same way that households have to have an income in order to spend. Government actually can't even spend tax revenue in the way that you spend your income. Because you receive your income, let's say, as direct deposits to your checking account. I presume that you do that in Australia too. And then you draw that down as you spend. But when the government receives tax revenue, all it is doing is debiting bank accounts. It's just gone. It can't be spent. The, the government actually can only spend um, in, in the United States and probably in Australia. The Treasury needs a deposit at the central bank. And it can't get that by debiting your account. It just disappears. So the analogy just is not um, really useful and it prohibits us from understanding the way governments actually spend. And there's, there's a colleague, an American colleague of ours who tells the story that uh, in the American system of, of pay as you earn sort of, uh, st sort of pay, payment of taxes through post offices, he tells this humorous story about uh, at the end of each day or whatever the period is, they bundle up all the notes that people have paid in taxes across the postal clerk's counter and uh, the Federal Reserve takes it away and incinerates it. I think the other, I think the other important point is though that, that this, this conversation, this particular topic, marks the fundamental difference between the fixed exchange rate convertible model of the gold standard or its derivatives and the fiat monetary system. Because under a, a gold standard, the, the, the quantity of money was regulated by how much gold there was, more or less. And so if governments wanted to spend more, then they had to finance that spending by taking by, each, by borrowing or taxing because there was only a, a finite capacity dictated by the, the artificial relationship between the, the currency unit and the commodity that was benchmarking against gold. Whereas under a fiat currency, once you do away with the convertibility, that is the ability to be able to take that currency unit and get gold for it, or US dollars more, more recently, once you do away with that convertibility, well then the, the whole concept of financing just disappears.